And so different ways of approaching magic and different people's approaches are going to be speaking to different parts of the psyche and then different parts of the system, right? Because if you're just talking to yourself, it doesn't really matter. But if you're talking, trying to communicate to other people, you have to work harder, hit across, right? And so I think this is how I, I, this is what I think music is to me and why music is such a magical thing, is somebody is having that communication with me without having any way of knowing that I'm receiving it as they intended. Uh, so I look at, uh, like there's music that I listen to specifically when I know that I have grief stuff that's blocked because it will just cause me to break down and it's not something I'm great at. Uh, so it's like, okay, time to go listen to some things that will get, let me get this out of my system. Right. And so in a way I can kind of look at those and go that for me, whatever the intention was of that person, these are kind of spells of, of road opening for my grief. Um, and I see this with a lot of stuff. So I'm like, that last, I have never listened to anything other than techno train, but that like half of the electric callboy album that came out a couple years ago, I think, uh, is like my super happy music. <laughs> like Dua Lipa is like super happy music to me. Like, okay, if I'm like almost there, but I'm not there, and I know that it's just because I've got too much shit in my head, I can use music to move beyond that. And so music is this communication between the artist and me, but then it becomes, once it's recorded, this tool that I can pull out of the toolkit whenever I need it to do whatever I need it to do. Welcome to the Casual Temple. This week, I'm beyond thrilled to have Aiden Walker as our guest. Aiden has been delving into the realm of magic for more than four decades. An experimenter and an innovator, Aiden has crafted an approach to magic that is as diverse as it is non-dogmatic. His journey, marked by time spent in nature, introspection, and deep breathing, has led to a transformative shift in perspective. Aiden's three books, Six Ways, Waving Fate, and Changeling, are the documentation of his unique perspective. Aiden, I'm so excited to have you on the casual temple. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I did want to show you, because I know one of your books, you talked about like making tabs of your book. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's my favorite thing. It is totally my favorite thing. <laughs> I, I really early on when Six Ways came out, somebody posted one of those and I was like, wow, that's like, I have those books from, from other my, people? First, my first copy of Jan Free's book was like <sighs> demoed. So yeah, I want to, oh man, now you're, you make me want to talk about it. Jan Freeze or Jan Freeze. I don't know how you say it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, Jan, uh, one of those. Um, well, cool. So now I know I'm, you know, the big fan, no secret. But um, so I think what I wanted to talk about today, if you're open, I think you are, we talked about it, um, is sort of your path of music. And I know you're a musician and how that path kind of led you to where you are and sort of I'm sure it was very parallel to your magical path, um, mainly because I like to get uh, new artist recommendations <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. So it would help me understand you as a person and kind of, yeah, I think it, I'm very excited to know. <laughs> very good. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm down with that one. I'm always happy to talk. <laughs> uh, hang on just a second, though, because I'm getting unstable messages and I oh, can okay. fix that. No worries. Hang on. I am not plugged in directly to my router and that might help. So let's go to ethernet. That should settle in a little bit now. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. So yeah, I guess um, we can say, I know you mentioned that you were into punk rock music. So was that sort of your <laughs> first foray into all of this? <laughs> Oh man, kind of. Yeah. You know, I was like, I grew up, you know, my, the formative childhood years. So like three to 13 were in the seventies. Mm. So, uh, that's what I grew up with. And, um, right at the end of the seventies, I'd already gotten into some weird shit. I got into like Klaus Schultz back then. Mm -hmm. Who's like a, you know, German, 
synthesizer guy who made some pretty weird albums. Uh, but I was into all the usuals, you know, at that time, Jethro Tull, Rush, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I got turned on by a friend onto punk, into punk rock with like this, like now I just, I, I wish I had it or at least the set list, but uh, it was a mixtape of everything from Sex Pistols and The Damned and The Avengers and The Dead Kennedys. Uh, uh, the Stranglers were on there, I know. Uh, and then ended with a couple tracks from Throbbing Gristle. Uh, and so super wide ranging. Yeah. And uh, when I found that, I was like, oh, I'm all in to yeah. the weird shit. Like, I didn't know the weird shit was really out there. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing the Sex Pistols on TV when they came through San Francisco on that last tour. Uh, they were on the news. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, I remember seeing that hanging out with my grandma. But uh, yeah, it's once I got into that, I was just like, okay, show me. I was like kind of super into hardcore for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then that really diverged. That got me into the early, you know, earliest Cure albums and Susie and the Banshees and some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, then it got weird. Then it got, then I got into the weird shit. So. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, like what? Oh, now I'm like, what's the weird shit? Okay. So the weird shit, (laughs) the story about the weird shit is, oh, let's turn that off. We don't need notifications in this. Um, uh, so me and my friend Aaron and a, no, well, a number of our friends were hanging out. We used to hang out in this little cafe that was really like a Denny's. Like I think it had been a Denny's that had mm-hmm. gone out of business or, or they moved to a better location. And this other restaurant took on. So if you imagine the inside of an old Denny's, not the current models, but uh, where you had the endless coffee and you could smoke inside because it was, you know, a million years ago. Yeah. And so it was like nine kind of half jocks half punks that we hung out uh chain smoking and just talking shit and drinking coffee and eating french fries for hours in this Mm. place they must have hated us (laughs) but uh there was another crew in there that we didn't talk to but they were obviously the other freaks and i don't know why we never talked to them Mm. but um one day they dropped off a book of matches like in front of me with their phone number in it and said if you'd like to talk call us And so my friend and I, Aaron, called them and they said, come over, we'll make you waffles. (laughs) And we went over to this house and it was kind of the first. So Aaron was like three years older than me. So I was 15, 14, 15. Um, Well, it would have been 15. And uh, it was kind of the first anarchist house I'd been in. That these people were really not like the people I knew. Mm -hmm. Uh, Really interesting, serious books uh and playing us uh i think they played us some stockhausen and they played us some noi Mm -hmm. and then they played us force the hand of chance by psychic tv and i was like what is this more than it was so weird i didn't even know if i liked it but i'm like this is the weirdest thing i've ever heard Mm -hmm. uh and so went and bought it i found a copy of it in berkeley took the train into berkeley and got it and rode the temple uh, cause at that point, if you sent them international reply coupons, they would send you something in return. Um, and while I was waiting for that, I like went back into, I think Rasputin's records in Berkeley and found the guy that I kind of knew from buying punk rock records there was into strange stuff. And I'm like, okay, force the hand of chance. What else should I get? And he hooked me up with Cabaret Voltaire and um, Current 93 and some Zev and some Non. And uh, I'm sure there was other stuff. Uh, Yeah, a few records that I can't remember who put them out. Uh, You know, some, but, uh, and I'd already gotten into things like Holger Shukai at that point from Mm. Cannes. Uh, So I, but I got more into can at that point. So my, my musical horizons just kind of jumped from the super, just straightforward rock and roll stuff, which is still my all time favorite thing, but uh, into all this kind of crazed nonsense that just went well with reading very different books than most of my friends, Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which began to explain what was some of what was different with me. Uh, 
though it would take me an incredibly long time to kind of label it and go like, oh yeah, I actually have this magical worldview. Mm. Even though I grew up in the absolute most boring suburbs of California one could hope for at that time. Uh, you know, and it was like, oh, okay, if this is the part of the world that makes sense to me, no wonder where I grew up just fucking sucks. <laughs> like beyond what most of my friends thought it just fucking sucked. Like, yeah. yes, it's boring, but it's also going to kill me if I stay <gasps> in this kind of universe. For real. Yeah, I think that's what most people when they have uh, discovered punk rock have ex uh, explained, like even the musicians I love who kind of came after punk really, um, they all say the same. It just like cracked their brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Into being something new. And so it sounds like very similar. Yeah. Cause you know, I was like close enough to Berkeley that with this antenna that I rigged, it was like 30 miles east, but mm. 20, 20 miles east. But if I rigged this antenna just so in my room, I could pick up maximum rock and roll on KPFA. Mm -hmm. So I got all the hardcore from them. Uh, but I hadn't found anything that was kind of playing the super strange shit for the most part for a while. Mm -hmm. But you know, that turned me on to that actually got me sneaking out of the house more and taking Bart into San Francisco and going to hardcore shows when I was 15. Uh, so I got to see just dozens of amazing bands. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, my first ever show was TSOL, the dead Kennedys in seven seconds. Dang. Uh, uh, you know, and that was just like, Whoa, if this is what we're doing, I am all about it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of energy for sure a lot of different yeah, ideas bouncing off the walls <laughs> literally yeah, yeah it, it, it was that particular moment in time was like that whole nazis punks fuck off thing from dead mm -hmm. kennedys was right then mm -hmm. and that was an issue right there were like big fights uh it was not always safe uh mm -hmm. because of that um and I'm like super standoffish in general. Yeah. So I didn't actually get to know anybody. <laughs> that was like one of the <laughs> retrospectively weird things. Like, no, I just come here to like lose it with you all. And yeah. then I'm going Bye. to go spend <laughs> yeah. the next five hours in Golden Gate Park until the train opens so I can sneak back home before my parents realize I'm gone. Right. Uh, yeah you're speaking to me I'm a little bit like that too I'm like in 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 in, in I gotta get out I gotta be by myself for a while <laughs> yes that was all the people I can do yeah <laughs> and peopling for the day for sure oh wow yeah so you made me think of like so my kind of era like I like all the like goth bands like Bauhaus is probably my favorite band yeah um Susie Banshees you mentioned um I grew up or I went to uh high school here in Everett for a couple of years right when grunge was like like exploded mm -hmm. so that's a big part of my own purview and then my family dragged me to stanwood which you might be familiar with because it's up yeah. in sort of your area awful for a what 14 year old it's the worst thing in the universe to be stuck <laughs> in farm country uh, um but i was like uh, uh very much vibing with you because you were like i'm trying to get the antenna sing signal for my radio station which was based in seattle which was 107.7 because we were out in the country i'm trying to like bend it <laughs> so <much laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah so like that was a funny time because it's like i was heavily i was going to a ton of shows um i was dating somebody that was super into the grunge scene and kind of mm -hmm. related alternative stuff around there yeah and like i never got nirvana like <laughs> kind of to this day it like <laughs> I can appreciate it, but yeah. I'm not going to listen to it. Right. But I was, I'm a huge Alice in Fain's, Chains fan. Like fucking Lane and Oof. Jerry Cantrell, fucking amazing. Yes. Um, Screaming Trees, I was a fan of because of Lanigan. And I've been a Lanigan fan until he passed a couple of years yeah. ago. So he's kind of my voice. If I'm looking for a, a voice in music for coming out of a male, it's Mark Lanigan. Is one of the most unique voices ever, for sure. And um, I loved Tad. Oh, Tad I, is deeply uncool, I think, but Tad were fucking great. No, I blast Tad <laughs> when I'm tuning around Seattle because it sounds badass. <laughs> like, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, Inhaler is my, one of my all time favorite records. That's just one of the most hammering records. Yes, I like that hammering. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess I call it like sludge. I guess it's sludge rock or whatever. 
um, like the Melvins. I've been listening to a lot of Melvins, Melvins lately. And so, yep. yeah. I'm, I, I, you know, the thing that I, I haven't listened to the new record from them, but mm. uh, that Crystal Fairy record that they did with Terry Gender Bender is like way on my constant rotation. That's one of my favorite records. Yeah. And they're definitely um, a group, uh, a band that has like, we're going to do this for this album. You guys figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Which I totally approve of. Yeah. 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 I really love that. Oh, wow. That's very cool. Yeah. I think the, um, yeah, I definitely know some of the German, the Kraut rock, rock too that you mentioned. And they're pretty cool too. A lot of the like newer bands that I listen to, they're always talking about Neu and Throbbing Gristle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Cool. What's the other stuff from there? Like Faust is great. Like Faust 4, that's a great record. Um, mm -hmm. What else did I get into from that kind of stuff? Um, that Aphrodite's Child 666 record is kind of hugely famous and worth it. Um, oh. I really like this band, This Heat, who have a record called Deceit, uh, which is killer. And just uh -huh. almost like, yeah, there's parts of it that are like, this is kind of like if Monty Python was like, a prog band mm. it's not normal at all I like uh, <laughs> um, and uh god what else did i get into because it was kind of that period i don't know tons of stuff but i don't remember it all yeah I'm and sure then kind of 90s yeah the 90s for me was like yeah nick cave mm. mm -hmm. crime crime in the city solution um i'm a huge Roland s howard fan who was both in crime in the city solution and in the birthday party but mm -hmm. i like him better than any of the other bands um and uh there was a band from davis like the cow university mm -hmm. uh in the northern california ag, ag big ag school uh mm -hmm. called thin white rope who are really amazing um i saw them probably 30 times they were so good um and then you know sonic youth and then my favorite band out of the 90s was live skull just Ooh. straight up live skull is that's the soundtrack of previous to that yeah like in my 15 16 it was like the cure and then later oh. on it was live skull yeah okay yeah because that was actually sort of one of the questions i was going to ask like if there was a biopic made about you what would be on the soundtracks so oh man so. yeah totally <laughs> it's a, such a it's such a weird blend yeah the flesh eaters Ooh, uh flesh eaters. coming from the yeah but only like yeah the forever came today and a hard road to follow that band which was the more rock and roll band version of it uh definitely the first yeah like 17 seconds faith and pornography from the cure mm -hmm. um and then all of live skull they just got back together and their stuff's fine but well the main guy who's got a new band using the same name but mm -hmm. uh the live skull records are amazing uh incredibly bleak and just angular and weird uh so good shit. that wow cool yeah that definitely sounds like a soundtrack i would be into cool. <laughs> <laughs> um now this seems like a um you know so i know you do a lot of long bike rides do you listen to music on those bike rides at all or do you are no. you completely just no no i don't yeah no i don't do music when i do that yeah, yeah kind of no, that's one of those things it's kind of meditative mm -hmm. and um i try and do it out in nature as much and i just kind of get i was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago that was i was showing the woods around here like i think that part of my function in this world is to wander around in nature and like mm -hmm. coo about it like like fuck you're cool fuck you're so cool <laughs> <laughs> I love the moss. It's so cool. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. I'm sure nature appreciates all the humans. I, it may not, but it, but it's it's going to happen anyway. Right. <laughs> yes. I'm going to like think you're cool and you're, you know, we're going to have it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now this is like, so what simu similarities do you see in sort of this, how I'm tying them together, like music and magic? I see it all the time. Oh man. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, like, 
And while it's ostensibly a book on sigils, this is actually kind of the other piece of it is the book that I'm working on now kind of discusses this. So one way we could think about magic, if you're an animist like I am, or even if you're thinking about it psychologically, there's other models that may not, this may not work as well, but is that these different practices are different ways of speaking, that it's a communication tool, um, that there's this that if we kind of pull it aside from that, we're going to impose our will upon the system and instead subdivide that and go, okay, instead, what if what we're doing with all of these different actions that we do is we're creating different languages or different sentences, or maybe different ways of using languages and sentences. So some things are poetry and some things are technical manuals, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so different ways of approaching magic and different people's approaches are going to be speaking to different parts of the psyche and then different parts of the system, right? Because if you're just talking to yourself, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But if you're talking, trying to communicate to other people, you have to work harder yes. to get <laughs> it across, right? Yes. Uh, and so I think this is how I, I, this is what I think music is to me and why music is such a magical thing is somebody is having that communication with me without having any way of knowing that I'm receiving it as they intend it. Uh, so I look at, uh, like there's music that I listen to specifically when I know that I have grief stuff that's blocked because it will just cause me to break down. Yeah. And it's not something I'm great at. Uh, so it's like, okay, time to go listen to some things that will get, let me get this out of my system. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in a way I can kind of look at those and go that for me, whatever the intention was of that person, these are kind of spells of, of road opening for my grief. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see this with a lot of stuff. So I like that last, I have never listened to anything other than techno train, but that, like half of the electric callboy album that came out a couple of years ago, I think, uh, is like my super happy music. Mm-hmm. Like Dua Lipa is like super happy music to me. Like, okay, if I'm like almost there, but I'm not there. And I know that it's just cause I've got too much shit in my head. I can use music to move beyond that. Uh, and so music is this communication between the artist and me, but then it becomes once it's recorded, this tool that I can pull out of the toolkit whenever I need it to do whatever I needed to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, like (laughs) super odd one that I was thinking about the other day. Uh, I've listened to Hounds of Love every time I've flown since that record came out. Really? Like for whatever reason, like when they make you buckle your seatbelts, I turn that on. Uh, And so I've taken off to that first track every single flight I've been on in whatever it is, 30 years. Wow. Uh, and it's like this super weird little magic thing and it just makes every flight perfect, you know? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's so funny. Cause now I'm like thinking of all the little things that I tend to do with that too. I think there's like a new order. I'm sure there's that song. I'm trying to remember it. Um, it's a, uh, if they had it for the um, real world, like the, uh, the titled track, like they played this New Order song. Every time I've moved into it, and when I moved into my first place, like on my own, I played that song. And so now every time I move into a new place, I play that song. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Absolutely. it kind of sets the tone of like being independent and, you know, on my own, but, you know, but missing home kind of thing. Absolutely. And I also think, yeah. you know, like, uh... and then there's music that also just changes how I think. Mm. Like, I'm a huge fan of this guy, Chris Whitley, because he changes what I think. Like, a, his, his, he's, like, really not, he's probably not clear enough for most people. He's a, he's not, he's a hard sell for most people. Uh, and for those of us who are into him, we just fucking, the, the dude was just fucking astounding. But uh, it's, like, the majority of his songs, I don't know what they're about. Mm. and I've been listening to them for 20 years. Like, I don't know. Like, different days I have different thoughts about it. And he was really clearly not trying to tell you 
a coherent story. He was very much viewing this as some kind of poetry. Mm. And he talks about that. And it's it was one of the things that I thought was really cool about him is uh, I heard an interview with him. Uh, and uh, they said, so what is your like approach to songwriting? He goes, well, I think everybody's really boring for the most part because it's all so clear. Mm. And he goes, and to me, like the perfect song ever is this Howlin' Wolf song, which I don't know if you know or not, but called Smokestack Lightning. Mm. Uh, check it out. Yeah. And from that perspective of, and he says, and what is that song really about? It's really hard to tell. Like, it's not, he's like, you know, people have, this is what he's talking about. And maybe he said, this is what he's talking about, but just listening to it it's about something on a visceral level mm. that maybe doesn't actually have a cognitive, like a conscious cognitive version, you know? And Chris is like that for me, that there's shit, there's songs of his that I absolutely love that periodically all go like, what do I think that he's even talking about here? And it's like, I don't know, <laughs> but it's like crushing. It's mm. crushing, you know? Mm. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, I like that. Yeah. Sounds like the um, like swans, kind of the similar sort of yeah. So I definitely I was a big swan. I was a big swans fan. Yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to see them a few times back in the day. I saw them for Children of God and Oof. two things after. I can't remember what the other ones were, but really mm -hmm. killer band. Yeah, it's like the same thing. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but speaking to something in me. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> I have a great swan story from back then. I was like probably seventeen. And uh, maybe a little bit older because I was at that bookstore for a while. And so I was working at a tower bookstore that was attached to a tower record store as they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the bookstore was filled with music freaks as well, you know. Uh, and uh, this guy, Serge, and Serge somewhere is out in the world, so I won't say his last name, but mm -hmm. uh, he moved here, moved there from Russia. And so he was this kind of, I think he was a drummer or a bass player, total metalhead, like 18 years old beard down to his waist. Cause he's, you know, that kind of guy. And, uh, so he's dropping off various music and we're checking it out. And I gave him a cop, I gave him a cassette of Holy Money by the Swans. And he came back in the next day and he's like in that, super burly super fresh uh, off the boat accent he's like this isn't metal but it's heavy as fuck <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes <laughs> it's like you understand my friend <laughs> you know i uh, loved them wow yeah that's a good that's a good one i love those like trading that's something that's missing is like trading those tapes with people <sighs> It's like the best thing. Such ever. a thing. You <laughs> yeah. know, it's, it's, I was thinking about it. Uh, one of the things that I do enjoy uh, about the online world is such mm -hmm. a weird one. And I finally figured out why, <laughs> which is I like watching reaction videos to music that I love. I like watching people hear it for the first time. And it's because I used to do that. I used, I remember I got the Japanese import of pornography by the cure before it was released in the U S and took it over to my friend Don's house and put it on while he was in the bathroom and got him loaded and right. said, tell me what band this is and put it on. And he was like, I don't know, is this public image? And he's the guy who turned me on to the cure because it was such oh, a violent that change. Is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, no, it's the fucking new cure record. And he's like, wow. You know, and I miss that whole thing of sitting in a room with somebody playing music that they have not heard before and watching mm -hmm. them groove on it. Oh my gosh. Now, now I'm like, I need to watch music. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a horrible rabbit hole, but uh, it's my yeah, definite, sure. it's my definite uh, time sucker <sighs> when I need just to zone out. That's what I do. Yeah. And it's super positive. I would assume for the most part. Oh yeah, it's like you just find people that you do, that you're kind of like, oh yeah, I want to see this person deal with Lane Staley. Let's see. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Lane's amazing voice and and uh, what are you talking about, Lane? You know? <laughs> For sure. Oh my gosh! Wow. Um, yeah. So definitely, and I know you're. So you, um, 
So we talked definitely about music and I know you mentioned sort of books in your writing as well. And uh, would you say that there are similar kind of paths with books in your life that were influential? Um, <laughs> yeah, and I have to throw Monster Magnet in there because I missed that one of it. <laughs> <laughs> diehard Dave Windorf freak. Oh, and okay. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> anybody is welcome to judge me because yes, it is incredibly ridiculous and fantastic. But um, yeah, so uh, I remember I was reading like kid books, uh, you know, in elementary school, young adult stuff. Um, and then in fourth grade, I read The Lord of the Rings. Um, and that was really cool. And then that like opened up this whole thing about science fiction and fantasy. And so I kind of started with the stuff that like the adults were like legit with for kids, which is like Ray, Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. But I really got into some fucked up shit really fast. Uh, and <laughs> by the, by sixth grade, I was kind of like, what's the weirdest shit I can find? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that got me heavily into Michael Moorcock. Oh, yes. Uh, which got me into Hawkwind. So that was a direct mm -hmm. <laughs> interrelation, which was a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, when I was, yeah, when I was 11, uh, I was, I got into Moorcock because uh, my brother bought me a calendar that was Rodney Matthews, who's also famous for his album cover art for mm. uh, Nazareth and things like that. Uh, and it was this, it was all fantasy and it was all illustrations based on Michael Moorcock stories. Uh, and I'd never read any Moorcock. Uh, and so I found Moorcock, started reading his stuff. And um, shortly after that, I had a, uh, an interaction in a dream with the man in black. Uh, in the bookstore that I went to to buy science fiction in Berkeley. Uh, and that was kind of the switch that turned me into whatever it is I am now. Right. <laughs> That's a straight up. Yeah, I I, uh, I have a straight on, straight up, yeah, visionary experience sent me down this road, so. I like that it was like a book that did that for you. And especially since it seemed like your, at least your musical influences were kind of prog rock and they all did the fantasy, you know, they did all talk to the fantasy stories. It was all like, yeah, it's like either prog rock or like, yeah, just like super jamming stuff or like, mm. let's go kill ourselves in the rain, goth stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> sure. but, uh, so I got into that stuff and, uh, it didn't know that that was a magical event, but the whole mm. experience stuck with me. And previous to that, I was different. I know that like my life radically changed after that. Mm. And part of that was um, within another couple of years, I bought book four by Crowley and earth power by Scott Cunningham. And, um, the Spiral Dance by Starhawk. And uh, it was, it would have been right in there. That would have come in right before. And then in 82, I would have gotten the gray book from the Temple of Psychic Youth and Ralph Bloom's book on runes. And so all of that stuff kind of sent me in like, okay, this is what I'm interested in. Um, this is what I, what, what is making sense. And then I had exposure through my dad's books of the first three Castaneda books, which retrospectively I could see really informed my worldview. Like I didn't, right. they didn't stick. But if I think about how I think about magic, there's more in that than there is in Crowley or in the Spiral Dance or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in that it's this super kind of peculiar between the worlds, transvisionary stuff. Right. Yeah, I guess that was something I was thinking about too. In books that, you know, so of course you read a lot of magical books, but it seemed like the things that maybe weren't quote unquote magical, like the Moorcock books and then the Castaneda books were the ones that really kind of shifted things for you, it sounds like, in a way. Yeah, I think I was looking specifically for a different worldview. And so mm -hmm. I think I had to find the people who were really unapologetic about that worldview. 
which I got both in some some rock and roll. I got mm-hmm. it in <laughs> some science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. Um, so Castaneda was like that. And then some fantasy stuff was because generally it's like I could kind of look at like Starhawk stuff. And she was, I was really too young to kind of get the politic there. And mm-hmm. I was never really wired to the politic. Like I was, I think from a really early age, I was like, the world is insane. And so assuming that there's a social way to undo social insanity, mm. I don't think I ever really bought all the way. Um, uh, and I was definitely too young to really grasp kind of the feminist stuff in there. Mm. Though that became very important later on. Um, and Crowley, I, I, I read Crowley for a long time trying to figure out what it was. And I was finally like, I don't believe this guy. Like, mm. I don't think he knows what he doesn't hasn't experienced Hmm. like i think he was so in his head and it's not saying he didn't experience a lot of shit but he was clearly so cerebral that i was like that's a different universe than mine Hmm. i think it's very much a lot of people's universe yeah um and then later on kind of coming into the kind of ideas of neurodivergence and things like that mm-hmm. that began to make more sense of like oh yeah you know if i think about curly curly was not neurodivergent mm-hmm. uh that's really clear you go no that's the he's, he's not showing any of that um but spare mm-hmm. quite possibly yeah uh you know uh and so i think i was looking for different narratives about reality more than I was looking for technique most of the time. And it took me a long time to realize that. Uh, And so I got more from reading on, you know, Haitian voodoo, Mm -hmm. though I never practiced it, um, because it was showing a different way of thinking. Um, A lot of both uh, indigenous written and then anthropology about indigenous cultures, primarily U.S. indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is, again, when I was really young. Retrospectively, I can see I was looking for a worldview that didn't seem as fucked up as the one that I was surrounded by. Um, And so that was really all kind of super crucial uh, to that. And then kind of, I mean, it's like, I think Kenneth Grant was more useful to me than Crowley was because again, it's like, this guy's a nut job. What does it, it's like, clearly this didn't happen the way that he described it. This was my Mm. brain reading Kenneth Grant early on. Like, cause we would know if all of these people were dead that are apparently dead, you know? Uh, But it turned me on to folks that were influential just in their being unapologetic grant for one um michael bertow of the gnostic Vudan workbook not my thing the mm. whole thing not my thing but unapologetic uh like this is weird this is way beyond woo weird this is you know uh and then that was also the thing was that's like i had exposure to people who were wiccans who were new age folks who were whatever who were badass mm-hmm. and i knew a lot of ceremonialists and i was in the chaos scene for a while who really looked down on that and right. sometimes it was funny because I was like, like, I know 70 year old women who would smoke your ass <laughs> if you decided to have a magical ba- battle with them. Mm-hmm. And they're just new age little Twinkies that if they got you in their crosshairs and thought you were a menace to society, you would not be anymore, you know? Wow. Uh, and so I was really open, like, this doesn't have to look any particular way. Right. Um, You know, Ramsey Dukes was really helpful for me. His book, SSOTBME, um, is kind of a really formative book um, because he was looking at like, have you read that book? Mm -mm. Worth reading, Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed. Whoa. But that's not what it's about, (laughs) Uh, which is why I like Ramsey. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) it's looking at, he, he basically comes in and he says, okay, so what if we put forward a model that said there are four different ways that one could look at the world Mm. and you could view and experience the world. And that is the artistic, the religious, the scientific, and the magical. And they become kind of a Venn diagram. Mm. So it's not that it's one or the other. You're going to have different degrees of intersection. 
And so he, to me, it was like, okay, this guy is actually thinking about the thinking behind the actions, which to me is interesting because it gets behind the mythology. Mm -hmm. Like we have a huge respect or there is a huge respect, I think, because it's got links into academia and because both the Golden Dawn and a lot of the, the United States pagan groups, even the uh, UK pagan groups as well, uh, have folklore backgrounds, right. like a lot of folklore scholars. So that's really accepted as this is a way that you can look at this stuff and make it uh, reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always kind of like, but what if it's not reasonable? Um, what if what's actually going on really is kind of a level of extremity over that? Uh, so like I began looking at folklore and going, well, a lot of folklore is explicitly anti-magic uh, and it's anti-individuality. Like the stories are what happens to you if you stray. Like that's not magic. That's right. anti-magic. Um, and, you know, reading a book by uh, John Crowley called Egypt, and I think it's been released under a different name, but it's a three book series of fantasy books. And great if you're into occultism, because John Dee is a character in it, Jordana Bruno is a character in it, but it's a, kind of these incursions of the past into these people in a small town. Um, and, uh, one of the kind of recurring themes in it, and I don't remember if this is the language he uses or not, is he basically says, you know, things were once not as they are now. And that really stuck with me because to me, that was the thing I was looking for as I was going, okay, I think we got off, me personally, no judgment on anybody that's happy with this place, but I think that we got off track really bad at some point. And it doesn't mean I want to go back to what was, but that we right. threw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so I began running off of a different kind of explanation model that said, okay, if I read this thing that says this guy would, this witch or whatever would do this thing, it would be transported into another world. I'm going to take that at face value. Now I don't know what is meant by was transported into another world. Right. <laughs> so I don't necessarily believe that that happens physically in any sense that we would understand as physical now. Mm -hmm. but that opened me up, think, I think, to kind of my experience of trance work, of going, ah, yes, I do that. I go into other worlds that are as real as this one and uh, are often far more impactful. Mm -hmm. And so which is the real world? Um, and I think that all used to be closer. Yeah. For humanity in general. Uh, and I think that we see this in kind of the records that, that have been made by a really unsympathetic people among indigenous populations throughout the world. You know, if a hundred years ago, people hadn't been quite such shits, we would have really good information that we don't. Uh, and uh, to me, that's a huge piece of magic is you go, okay, so it's not, Joseph Campbell hero with a thousand faces, no issues with that. It's good material. Um, but what if what we broadest umbrella call magic is a way to actively connect with very real worlds mm -hmm. that are critical to our survival as a species and that the divorce from that has us where we are now, which yeah. is what I believe and what my allies tell me. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of funny because I get a, this is why I'm behind the paywall of, of Patreon for the most part, but uh, anymore is uh, so many people want to go, yeah, but everything is natural. And you go, well, it depends what you mean. Mm -hmm. Would it have come about without you? or without our kind. So like, no, this lovely road microphone would never have manifested. You know, this computer would never have manifested. And yes, they're, they're awesome. I love yeah. them. Um, but we're disembodied from our, the physical yeah. in a way 
which was kind of, I think, an intentional move of Western industrialism. Um, and the thing that had to go for that to happen was this connection to what I am calling magic in its broadest sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's amazing. I've been thinking a lot because I've been working um, with some of my ancestral spirits as well. And so, and I've been thinking a lot about um, the, because I, my dad was Irish American, my mom is Filipino, both cultures kind of like their history is pretty much removed <laughs> for the most part is, you know, but sort of what I've kind of gotten from the ancestors, the ancestors that I've communicated with is sort of doing sort of trance ex excavation with them of like sort of those past histories Mm -hmm. now where that butts up against is i think maybe is the material world right because in our material world they say oh but you need the anthropology anthropology evidence of this and this and this and this and this um and so i think that that's where we sort of have that that disconnect of kind of where you're talking about we're sort of all up in the mind and not really down into the body in the yeah. material world well that's what's interesting is it's is it's is it's uh i think is it's it is like uh i mean to use the modern terms and the stuff that based on what i've been playing with it is it's like it's a it's like a a somatic disconnect mm -hmm. whereas that psyche soma thing is intended if we look at psyche in its er earlier form as i love to quote is you know body mind spirit yeah which is an interlaced thing. It's a singular thing. It's not three different things. Right. And I think that that move is how do you get people into the city and into the factory? Mm. You have to generate that separation. Right. Because who's going to walk into that, especially as shitty as it was back then, you know? Yeah. Uh, like, really? Like, I'm sorry, we may go, ooh, yeah, I don't want to go plow the fields. Right. <laughs> but plowing the fields versus digging in the coal mine? I'm plowing the fields, babe. Yeah. That's a way better way to spend 40 hours a week. Uh, you know, both are going to have a physical toll. Mm -hmm. And then you get into, you know, early kind of youth child labor industrialism which still we export to other places now it still goes yeah. on mm -hmm. uh you go that's not oh, this is where the allies won't let me be uh <laughs> correct that's not right uh mm. you know i want to say it's not correct but they're like no it's not right yeah. uh that's not something that you should do if you're looking for something called health or wellness Mm -hmm. uh you know and you can come up with a billion arguments for it but they're all going to be cerebral yeah none of those are going to be true in the body yeah uh and so to me that's the that's it that's so how do you mesh kind of this body and spirit aspect without throwing out the intellect right but how do you put it in a into something like an equal partnership instead of going but we have to have all of the scientific proof and if anything it's very clear right now that that really only ever exists for like 10 minutes, you know, right. and then it gets changed with the new scientific truth and you go, okay, so how is this helping us, uh, to attach to it in kind of a religious fashion, which is what, and the answer is it allows kind of domination, mm. uh, and it allows that separation because people, if, if you were to, to me, if you were to connect everybody back to their kind of spiritual core, like the whole planet, all at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The people in power today would not be in power beyond tomorrow. Mm -mm. No. It's like, oh, yeah, no, half of us could die to take care of this. That would be okay. <laughs> right? That's the correct thing. So you go, okay, yeah, that's easy. That's easy <laughs> math. You go, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something in your books, you definitely, so, you know, it's kind of re looking at them before we had a chance to talk and you have this very, I call it like synesthetic way of writing where it's like, it kind of hits all of those things. It hits like the mind, body, spirit. And so it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like getting, and then a lot of your techniques are very much in, you know, describing all of that, like getting into your body, like discernment too, which does have that sort of um, intellectual component of like 
what are you, you know, asking yourself questions and like, you know, all of that. So I think that's really great. Um, so how do you think, um, so meaning, or so if your body is a separate entity and independent of, of the mind, why is it important to distinguish both? Mm, so yeah. it, it's, it's not, and this is actually an interesting mm. thing. So ever, the mind, the, 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 the hmm. so the current kind of, I'm going to say the kind of current scientific materialism model, which is breaking down, mm -hmm. um, would say that the, that the mind is over the body is how I would say it. If we were thinking of it hierarchically, right. But functionally we don't have that without the body. So the mind is the body right. and the body is the mind. What happens, I think, is that if we're disconnected from the actual experience that we're actually having in the body, mm -hmm. um, we become incredibly disconnected from ourselves. We aren't, we're like literally non-functional because uh, communication isn't happening both ways. Mm. So like I've seen this a million times in my life and I imagine you have too, where you like know something is, is, is not what you should do. And you like literally talk yourself into it mm -hmm. because you can't find the proof that satisfies that scientific materialist aspect of your consciousness uh, to just go, now I know that that's right. And I'm going with it, right? Right. Uh, because again, it's like, if we were to remove, just to bring it down to the, to the moment, and I won't go too political, but <laughs> because it's the obvious situation, yeah. if we were to remove all of the, story from what's happening in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. And it was just, this is what is happening here, or this is what's happening in all over the place. Uh, Africa, Haiti, for God's sake. Yeah. Um, and we removed all of the stories because there's tons of stories about why it's okay for these things to happen to the people it's happening to Right. And so if we remove that talk and we're just shown that, I think that as an animal who has a, some respect for other animals, people would go like, yeah, that's not good. Right. That's not what I want to have happen to people. Yeah. Um, and it's this layering of story mm. and not good story because it's story with an agenda. It's not a story that's trying to, to explain reality. Right. It's a story that's trying to constrain reality to a particular end, right? right? And so really it's an integration that we're looking for is how do you get to where you can say, okay, yeah, we've got all this tech, we've got all this medicine, we've got all of these, this ability to manufacture. Mm -hmm. And we know that perhaps 90% of that is pointed towards ends that aren't actually generally beneficial right like they yes they benefit particular people but they're not beneficial to the system as a whole so in a sense what we have is you know it's it's and again it's like it's not that humanity is this parasitic cancer but uh which is a point of view i have have held at different points in my life mm -hmm. um but instead that the way that we've arranged kind of our societal structures which is our mental structures and how we think and how we communicate about it mm -hmm. allows those who wish to operate in that way right. in an extractive way to do so because we can't find the specific proof that is universally accepted to say, no, that's just bad magic. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't do bad magic anymore because yeah. we want to be here in 500 years. Yeah. I like that perspective of like kind of looking at a situation without and then just maybe feeling in your body because if you think I'm thinking of my cats but like if my cats were to see like a group of cats fighting you know or whatever you know they would have like a specific reaction whether it is to jump in or you know try to calm somebody down like it wouldn't be wound up in the story of who did what you know they would just yeah. observe what is happening <laughs> well it's funny it's like I have you know I had goats 
when I lived out in the country and, and uh, these huge livestock guardian dogs uh, who were raised by other livestock guardian dogs and other goats, not by me. I just fed them, right. gave them water and got them vetted <laughs> by having the vet come out. Like they'd never been indoors oh, wow. anywhere, you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, they were really cool to learn from because it's like, uh, you know, they had games that they played with the Ravens and the Ravens, some of the Ravens figured out games that they could play with them. Wow. And they would totally, there was, there was rules, you know, it's, uh, and there was times you did this and there was a particular thing. You landed on this particular post and started talking. And if the dogs were, were into it, yeah. they would get up and come over and then they would play these games. Uh, and likewise, our dogs were bonded to, in order, the, each other, the goats, and then us. You know, if I had tried to, because we didn't, we weren't harvesting our goats. If I had tried to kill one of my goats, my dogs would have taken me out. Oh, wow. uh, I think no problem. Like, like, nope, that's actually my pack. You're my person mm. and that's cool. We like you, but this is my world, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the thing that was really interesting is they were like super judicious. So like the coyotes would come by, they'd talk to the coyotes. They clearly liked the coyotes as long as they were on the other side of the fence. Mm. Coyote comes in after the livestock. No, that's not acceptable. Um, but are they going to like go hunt down all the coyotes? No, they totally dug the coyotes. The coyotes are like, cool. They're like, right. you know, they're the roamers. They get news. I think the coyotes would probably give them news from what was going on for miles around. And our dogs were like, that's awesome, dude. Stay the <laughs> fuck away from my goat. Yeah, just stay over there. <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I think it is that thing. It's like, we're really weird in that we... Mm. Uh, can generate again story that says we can take all of something and destroy to whatever extent and it'll be okay because we're really smart we'll figure it out we always do <laughs> you know uh, and you know it's like i think they now think that we've been probably talking for like a hundred thousand years like we really haven't been around all that long right. in our current form. We haven't had this kind of power for more than, you know, depending on what day you pick it up yesterday or 200 right. years ago or 500 years ago. Uh, and I think we're just children and don't know what we're doing with it. Uh, so. Yes. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's definitely sort of deprogramming those stories of, what your body and your spirit and your your whole being knows is either right or wrong or however you view it. Yeah. And yeah. It's just like getting those out of there, man. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> and then it's just like, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's super interesting when I think when, when you look at it that way, cause you look at, okay, you know, we've generated the ability to like weirdly feed the planet multiple times over and yet oh, yeah. have a ton of people starving to death yeah and the people who get to eat everything they want to are really sick what's the fucking combo there like this is not hard to sort if you want to throw the money out there and stop listening to the people that don't want you to do this right. uh, you know it's all fixable and yeah. so that's the thing that's really kind of interesting and depressing is it's the, like, i know you're like it's so easy but you think it's so hard reason for any of this yeah it's like this is gonna get their maximum dividend this year <laughs> right oh man um yeah and i know that you have this discussion um in dara's dara mason's spirit box discord um mm -hmm. which is a really fun and great community it um is. regarding sort of movement and meditation and the thing i'm going to paraphrase you you can definitely correct me uh -huh. um, but what I remember was, you know, you said something about like, people don't move enough in today's world, like probably in the Western world and meditation is saying, you got to sit still. And you were maybe like, <laughs> how about we move a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a 50, 50 thing. It's yeah. a sit still is a great thing if you can. Right. Um, and it, this goes kind of more specifically into somatics as the language is used now into right. kind of somatic experiencing coming from Peter Levine's school of things. Mm -hmm. Lots of the polyvagal theory stuff from Stephen Porges 
and Deb Dana and it's that stuff that's very big right now and for good reason. I think there's an incredible amount of good in there. Um, I used to be very much of the, if you're wigging out, you should spend more time doing sitting meditation mm. uh, until I got into kind of personal high anxiety modes. And I went, oh, and it's impossible. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't have that at that point in time. Uh -huh. Interesting. God, I'm an asshole. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got 30 years of suggesting this to people that I really, mm. you know, from an AA standpoint, owe amends to. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, Darren and I were really talking about like at the point that like I get to the actual peak of my crazed levels of anxiety, the way that I started to get out of it was just walking myself to exhaustion, basically. Because mm -hmm. um, it would get me settled. It's like over time, it would get me settled uh, in a way that I couldn't do. I couldn't regulate that aspect of my neurology. Uh, but I could be fine if I walked. Uh, right. And I retrospectively know that that probably led to my like long distance running and my bicycling and my weightlifting and all the stuff that I've done over the years were ways that I was regulating that I didn't know, which also mm -hmm. allowed me to then meditate when I was able to, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so it's, again, it's just, it's not separable. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, a weird thing that I think is kind of relevant, which is that when we look at meditation, we kind of have to, depending on what we're doing with it, we kind of have to also look at what is the story behind what we're doing. Mm. Um, because sometimes that story is the one that I'm not really fond of, which is your body and your bodily drives and your bodily knowledge is wrong because it's not rational, right? which I don't agree with. I think it's differently rational. Um, and so if we're kind of fixated on that view, I don't think that we're getting the, we're not getting what would, what is helpful to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is kind of, it goes into what we were talking about before we started talking, whatever way you kind of map people, whether that's through neurotypicality and neurodivergence, whether it's human design and generators, and manifesting generators and projectors or whatever, mm -hmm. just the zodiac signs, introvert, extrovert, all of these things that are ways to try and explain how we're different mm -hmm. while being essentially the same structurally, the wiring is different. Right. Um, and so I think when we look at the meditation stuff, the more I tried to go into forms that were really trying to get me separated from my body in some ways, the less well I was. Mm. Um, because to me, that's, I can't operate that way. I'm definitely like supposed to be really in my body mm -hmm. and my body is where I get my knowledge from. Uh, I don't think in too much. Uh, I discover through my body what's going on. And then through using all of me, I'm able to, to come up with solutions that generally will work for me. They won't necessarily work for anybody else. Right. Um, you know, uh, and so I think that that is, it's, yeah. So, you know, now I would, I would pull back on my meditation recommendations for anybody that says, if you get, if you find you're getting more anxious, I would be looking at things like somatic, somatically based either therapies or counseling methods or just polyvagal release methods, things like that mm -hmm. to try and settle that. Right. Cause that's more important to me then you being able to sit for an hour because if you're agitated through that whole thing you're not getting any clarity yeah um and if you can get relaxed in a world that is really not designed for us to be relaxed and is kind of designed to be have us agitated yeah uh that's probably more important for most people right now uh, I know it is for me. It's like, no, it's like, what, what do I have to do to not be reactive uh, on a really base level, not at a high level? Right. Uh, that's something that can come in, in whatever times it comes, you know? Mm-hmm.
Yeah, I like, I, yeah, thank you for explaining that. Cause it's definitely something when I either work with people or talk with people about, you know, cause they're like, I, they want to also have sort of experiences with talking with their beings or their allies or their guides and they're having a lot of trouble. And, you know, the general thing is like sit and meditate, <laughs> but if you have all this other stuff going on, um, you know, maybe it is great to explore somatics or polyvagal or even exercise, you know, go for a nice long walk, see if that clears some stuff up. <laughs> right. And realize yeah. that like, you know, I've talked about it before, but you mm -hmm. know, it's, 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 there's really cool wiring stuff too, like the whole yeah. EMDR, e EMDR, I think, uh, is essentially a way of physically triggering the effects that we have of walking mm. through an environment mm -hmm. that it produces the same kind of stimulation that the optic flow of the right. world passing by right. you, which has major, major neurological effects and allows you to let go of things. Mm. And it allows you to think different things. This is like known by the neuroscience community. Um, and so there's, there's a reality to that, which again, then if we also look at that, you go, so everybody goes, well, I'll just go to the gym and walk on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. Do you have the option to not do that? And I understand not everybody does right, because right, right. it's not the same thing. Yeah. Cause then the world isn't passing you by. And so it's not just the movement. It's mm. the movement through space and your perception as you move through space is what you get from walking or running or cycling. Um, it's not just the fact that you get a particular kind of cardiovascular exercise. That's not it at all. I mean, it's not it in total. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's making me think like, yeah, it's basically, yeah, move, the actual movement through space, you're literally in a different headspace, <laughs> like moving mm -hmm. <laughs> through different spaces. Right. Hmm. Well, and, and again, cool. I think it makes so much sense because it's, kind of humans as localized in space for long periods of time is very new. Mm. Um, if we look at again, and I, I take a really long view. I don't care when we started talking. I think that we've been basically as we are for a long time, um, you know, several hundreds of thousands of years at least. Um, I don't think that the animal has changed. I think our higher brain changed. But mm. We're mostly the animal no matter what. Um we were mostly really mobile, that whole nomad, nom nomadism, hunter gatherers, all of that stuff. We're spending huge amounts of time moving through space. And so if we look at, it's kind of interesting, you know, there's in all of the office health things you'll ever see where they give out the pedometers and say, so well, they <laughs> want you to get 10,000 steps, which is about six miles, right? Yeah. So if you look at that, and then you look at kind of the ethnography of modern hunter gatherers in general, they say that most of those people move between six and 10 miles a day. So you could link that up and say, okay, so it's this 10 to 15,000 steps a day is the key. And you go, no, because they're actually moving through a world that they're completely engaged in. Right. They're having optic flow for hours. They're having communication with themselves, with each others in that moving state for hours a day. Right. This is not the same thing as going and watching the news on a treadmill or listening to a podcast on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to have a very different effect. Uh, and I think especially if you're viewing the world magically, that's not hard to then extrapolate out and go, oh, how, how do I best operate to get these things happening in a, in a way that the animal is designed for them to happen, which to me, I think is also probably why I've always, not always, but I've generally had a lot of access to the trance worlds mm. is I've very rarely been a driver and I'd prefer not to be on the bus. So I'm generally walking miles or riding miles every day. And so I think, parts of me get to settle out almost every day that probably don't for a lot of people. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely going to be thinking about that and thinking I need to go for more <laughs> walks for sure. Thank goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Aiden. Um, so definitely, yeah, so many things that you said, I'm going to be thinking about for many days now, for sure. Um, 
Uh, do you have any sort of, so we're kind of ending here, but okay. um, do you have any sort of upcoming projects or events that you want us to know about? Or? Um, not specifically. I'm going to be traveling for a good number of months. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what's coming up for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I've kind of, as I, as I kind of hinted at earlier, I've pretty much moved my entire online existence into Patreon. Uh, right. which is awesome. It's it is really fun. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's way more manageable for my world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, that's where most of my attention goes. And I've been cranking out videos in there. Uh, mm -hmm. I try and get out four videos a month, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. And that'll continue while I'm traveling. Uh, cool. But that's most of what I have going on. Nice. Yeah, I would definitely suggest um, I am in your Patreon. I'm just kind of quiet at the moment, but I'm definitely there. And there's like great community. Your videos are amazing. You're very engaging with the community. So I highly, highly recommend it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, no, I'm glad that it's working for people. I was like, really like, I don't know if anybody's going to care about this at all, but <laughs> right. you never know. You never know. So, so yeah, it's I'm been very good. Cool. Oh, yeah, I'm so thankful for that um, and that you have, you made that community. So that's amazing. Um, so generally how we, you have given us so many words of wisdom, but is there any sort of last words of wisdom that you would like to leave us with today? Um, well, I'm just going to speak to the people in the U.S. or the people that are connected to the U.S. Like, mm -hmm. I would strongly suggest maybe right now, because it's not a bad time because things will not level out of taking a little space and figure out how you're going to do the next six or seven months. Cause it's going to be messy. <laughs> Particularly in, in the news world and in the social media <laughs> world. It's like, we've all done that. Most of us have done this before. Not everybody was necessarily online the last time that this went around, but, mm. uh, these are, this is a, a particularly ugly election cycle and will only continue. And so I would suggest for the magically inclined folks, figure out now how you want to address that because you could choose. It's true. Great advice. Um, definitely hear that from like- I'm going to go ride my bike in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I'm like, that seems like the best solution. <laughs> I'm going to go camping for the next six months. <laughs> Yes. Oh man. Um, for sure. Well, it's definitely going to be those times. Uh, they'll be interesting to observe for sure and live in. Uh, but well, yeah. Thank you, Aiden. That was great advice. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, no, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Your support means the world to us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to like, comment, and share it with others who might find this content valuable. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more enlightening discussions. Your engagement helps us grow, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for being a part of the Casual Temple community.